Good morning, and welcome to worship here today at Holy Trinity. Uh, I know that uh, we're here at Holy Trinity. You're at home or wherever you may be, and we apologize for the, the need for it to be in this way today. Uh, just briefly, I'll explain what the situation that happened. We had a member who on Friday was contacted by someone that they had been in, in contact with over the, the past week, and they had experienced, uh, well, they had uh, tested positive for COVID themselves. So this staff member went and was tested and also tested positive. Normally, I don't think this would be an issue for us because I think we've done a great job of keeping our distance among our staff. Uh, the issue, however, was that this past week, this particular past week, we were in a conference room together, all of uh, us, for, for two days straight, all together, eating together in a vehicle with one another. And as much as we uh, put on social distancing measures, uh, masks and, and whatnot, and, and keeping away from one another, it was still uh, enough to cause us suspicion to whether we were contagious as well as uh, maybe asymptomatic carriers, as this staff member was as well. So out of an abundance of caution, yesterday we were all scrambling, trying to find urgent cares and places that we could uh, get rapid testing. However, these rapid tests didn't always come uh, to us so rapidly. Uh, it took a few hours to get tested, and then it also sometimes took a few hours to even hear back the results. Uh, Pastor Brackage, for instance, we've not heard his uh, re results yet, and so we continue to pray for him uh, that, that the res results would hopefully be negative. But with that, knowing that it was taking a long time to get some of our results back, uh, we had to make a decision that allowed, it our, that allowed our people enough time to make your plans for the morning. Uh, and so, uh, out of an abundance of caution, we had to assume the worst and therefore uh, made the decision for you all to, uh, to be at home today. I tested negative and most of the staff has also tested negative as well at this point. Like I said, Pastor Brackage we've not heard from yet. Uh, he's still awaiting results. Uh, three of the staff members were asked to quarantine, uh, continued on, so um, they're going to test again in the next few days uh, with uh, not the rapid test, just to see if, if it's a different uh, result, and we'll continue to go as, as we can. As far as next week goes, we anticipate having in-person service, in services once again, but we will let you know as things go on. We're monitoring this daily uh, to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our people. But above all, we wanted to make sure that you were safe and that you, uh, we didn't inadvertently spread the, the virus further than, than necessary. I wanna thank our volunteers who did uh, make an effort to be here. We told them uh, several times that they didn't have to be here um, but they, they willingly came anyway, and we are, we are thankful for them, and we uh, especially are thankful for our band today, our uh, volunteers in the back, uh, uh, David Monismith, Ben Post, and Keith Miller, uh, manning the table back there to allow us to bring this uh, virtual worship to your living room, or again, wherever you are. Uh, with that uh, being uh, suspended for in-person worship today, that shouldn't affect other activities, because uh, we were still, again, we were making decisions based on information that we didn't have, um, but had to assume the worst. Uh, that, that should mean that things this week are fine, with the one exception of because Pastor Brackage uh, hasn't had his results come back, we have to make a decision regarding confirmation, was supposed to resume in person this week, uh, but we're going to postpone that another week. You're still going to have confirmation, uh, kids, um, and adult volunteers. We're still going to have confirmation, but we'll do it in a virtual format, okay? So uh, you'll meet with your small groups in your Zoom or your, your Google Chats, I should say. Uh, you'll meet in that format, and then we'll hopefully resume in person next week. Again, we'll keep you up to date with that. Uh, other announcements. Uh, they'll be provided on the wrap. You can check out the, the online version of the wrap, should be available. If not, you can swing by the church tomorrow and we can get you a copy of it uh, easily. Same thing with the devotions uh, to help guide you. Those should be available digitally, but we can get you a hard copy as well if you swing by the church. With that, uh, it is time for us to worship our Lord. And so uh, let's, uh, let's open in a word of prayer, but first we begin our service today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are a good and gracious God. You are uh, a God who loves us unconditionally. Despite what we have done, despite the, the sin that is within us, you love us so uh, wondrously. 
We praise you for that, Lord, for this, this reckless love that you show to us day in and day out. We thank you that you allow us to call you Father, that you have opened the way for us to be your children through your son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world for us, died for us, and opens the, the path to heaven uh, in him. So, Lord, thank you for bringing us to faith. Thank you for making us your dear children. Lord, as we look at uh, the way of discipleship today, we recognize that you call us to be humble. Lord, your son, Jesus Christ, humbled himself, taking on the form of a human being, taking on the, the role of sinner as he went to the cross, taking our sins upon himself. He himself was sinless, but your wrath was poured out on him on our behalf. So, Lord, as we seek to be humble, help us to follow the, the, the role of Jesus, the, the example of Jesus, our Savior. Lord, help us to love other people, even if maybe we don't think they deserve them. Help us to recognize in humility that you love them and that you call us to love them too. Lord, lead us by your Holy Spirit. Be with us in our worship. Wherever we may be worshiping you now, bless our time, bless our homes, that they would be places where you are welcome, where your name is made known, and where you are glorified day in and day out. Bless us, Lord, we pray, and bring us back together as soon as we can. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. We continue with our call to worship. Uh, don't be alarmed, I'm gonna be speaking both parts uh, the whole time, but you can speak them with me, uh, the people parts. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship him. Alleluia. God bless your worship here today.
fire you won't tear down Come down to me No shadow you won't light up climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me what beautiful words to think about as we move into a time of confession seeking God's word of forgiveness how we have a mountain before us and it is a mountain of sins for I know the sins I have that are before me I know what I've done and uh, I am ashamed of that. I know the darkness that I walk in day in and day out. That yes, I am the light of the world because I am a, a disciple of Jesus. And yet still, I succumb to the darkness sometimes because I'm a sinner. How about you? I know that there is a wall that separates me. And maybe it's not that it specifically is there, but I've built it there. Or maybe I, I see it and I, I hide behind it so that I can get away from God, so that he doesn't see me. But the thing is, we're just lying to ourselves when that happens. If we say we have no sin, we're lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But you know what? With our God, there's no shadow he won't light up, no mountain he won't climb up, no wall he won't kick down, no lie he won't tear down coming after us. And so we confidently come before our God in a time of confession, seeking his grace through his son, Jesus Christ, because he's got a reckless love. That's kind of how he is. He's just given the stuff away. He's given his grace away. He wants to give it to us. And in so doing, he calls us to repent, to acknowledge our sin and admit it to him that, yes, we are sinners. We need this forgiveness and not take it for granted, but to let him know that we need it and we need his Holy Spirit to guide us into future living in that reckless love. So with that, we're going to have this time of confession. It is a call and response. Once again, uh, I'll speak the words. Uh, the band is going to speak the words as well for the people part, but I'm going to speak the, the people part too. So um, we speak this responsively slash together. <laughs> Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are to be honored and feared. God, we know you for your merciful character. We therefore turn to you in confession, seeking your mercy. We confess that we are slaves to sin 
and cannot free ourselves. Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have have sinned against you by the things we have done and by what we have neglected to do. We have sinned against you when we have not loved you, when we have not loved one another, and when we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We beg for your forgiveness, O Lord, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we sing our next song, we take a moment of silence just to reflect and confess before our God.
whatever is going on in your life, whatever's going on in your soul, your heart, as you wrestle over the things of this world, as you wrestle on, over uh, regret or, or pain or suffering from your own sin or the sins of others that have impacted you, God says, peace, be still, it is well. Uh, on, the night that Je- or on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and he spoke a word of peace. It says he appeared among them. They were freaking out and he breathes on them and he says, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. And he breathes on them and he gives them the Holy Spirit and he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. He, he calls us to forgive one another And he calls me as your pastor to forgive you as well. And it is my joy to get to speak that word of peace to you. That in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our next song. I would encourage if you're at home, stand up.
awesome God that we have that looks not at our sin, but sees us as his children, as his redeemed people. What an awesome God. At this time, with that awesome God that we have, we take our prayers to our Father, to our Heavenly Father, who seeks to have this relationship with us as his children. And so we lift up our prayers as usual. I'll say the prayers and I'll end each petition with, uh, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond, hear our prayer. And I would encourage you too. You might be at home. You might feel like, oh, I'm at home. I don't have to say it uh, out loud. But really do, say it out loud. Hear our prayer, all right? We pray for all of God's people in Christ Jesus and all others according to their needs. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, your ways are not our ways, neither are your thoughts our thoughts. Your word is true and your word is holy, though we often struggle to either understand it or to do what you command. Open our ears and open our hearts to hear and learn what you are speaking through such difficult words, so that as we are led by your Holy Spirit, we would grow in our faith in you and in our sanctified living. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, open the eyes of the spiritually blind so that by the light of your word and open the ears of those deaf to your calling with the voice of your gospel. By your Holy Spirit's working, clear the way for all people to know the riches of your grace, the gift of forgiveness and the promise of life by faith in you. Like little children, make us humble to receive you. In mercy, make us ready to receive those cast aside in the world and in urgency, Make us eager and willing to seek the lost for whom you suffered and died. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of the nations and Prince of Peace, graciously look upon our own government and our courts. Lord, preserve our nation and our state in justice and in honor that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. God, grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land. Especially we pray for the President and Congress of the United States the governor and legislature of Oklahoma, and to all who make, administer, and judge your laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will and not to, uh, not to further personal preferences. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord and giver of all things, we pray for our stewardship of your creation, for our faithful use of all your gifts, and for grateful hearts. With thanksgiving in our hearts, help us to honor you with our words and with our giving of time, treasure, and talents. Renew our lives of prayer and devotion so that we might make use of our time and energy, interceding and praying on behalf of all those in need and committing ourselves to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord and giver of life, we pray for the members of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church celebrating birthdays this week. We lift up to you Marcus Kruger, Linda Robbins, Avery Porter, Philip Winterston, Brooke Zajic, Zach Adams, Sawyer Hill, Jaden Schwiesau Moore, Rusty Barger, Larry Fern, Peggy Gruno, Matthew Howard, Susie Lawson, Angie Niemeyer, Oliver Zajic, Shirley Kuntz, Sarah Trowbridge, and Daryl Zumalin. Grant that they may continue to experience your blessings and may they be a blessing through every aspect of their earthly life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of love, we pray for couples celebrating marriage blessings this week as they mark their anniversaries, including Jay and Sherry Schallner, Michael and Terry Vogt, Brett and Debbie Hatchett, Royce and Rachel Bartlett, Paul and Deborah Hegemeyer, and Larry and Marquita Whitaker. Let the love of each of these couples grow stronger through every joy and sorrow experienced until that day when one shall lay the other into your arms for eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all comfort and great physician of body and soul, you know our every weakness. So we seek your peace for the troubled in mind, relief to the suffering, healing to the sick, peace and deliverance to the dying, and comfort to the grieving. We especially lift up our prayers for comfort and care on behalf of Tammy Bachman, Joel Bieber, Roger Bradford, Gary Johnson, Steve Kukuk, Karen Marshall, Gary and Michelle Quick, Sheila Robertson, Elsie Schatz, Jerry Shrum, Fred Van Weeren, the staff of Holy Trinity, and all those who suffer directly or indirectly from the coronavirus, and all others whom we name in our hearts. Deliver them from affliction as you will, and sustain them in hope with a patient heart and strength for the day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, Lord, 
We pray that you would grant us, for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'll let the band go, and you can uh, scram, you guys. Uh, (laughs) Thanks for being here, and that way you can mask up, too, and feel safe. Our scripture reading for today, in which the, the message will be based on, is from Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 7, and then 10 through 14. And Jesus, he's using a child as his, uh, his sermon illustration, if you will, to show uh, what, is, uh, what it's like to be uh, in the kingdom of heaven. His disciples, as usual, they come to Jesus asking like, hey, who's the greatest? Uh, and Vicar will expound on that a little bit more, but uh, they're always looking for who's the greatest. And Jesus tells them, you guys got it all wrong. You're looking for worldly greatness. Um, in, in God's perspective, in God's economy, things are a little bit different. And here's what he says. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, so who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a small child and said to him, uh, and had him stand among them, Truly I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses will inevitably come. But woe to that person by whom the offense comes. See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the 99 on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the 99 that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And with that, we uh, speak the words of our confession of faith, what we believe in our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With that, if you're still standing at home, you can have a seat. And uh, the vicar's going to come forward and have a children's lesson. Good morning. Here we are again. It's one of those things that, as I was kind of considering what to, where, where to go with the children's lesson, one of the things I kind of considered was just the simple reality of what we're experiencing. It's truly remarkable, and it's something that I think we can look very closely at some of the scripture lessons that we've had, and especially this one today. Jesus talks very explicitly, and he heaps a lot of praise upon the idea of children, the idea of having humility, being humble like a child, having the faith of a child. And I think for all of us, it's, there's a lot to learn there in that sense. But one of the things that I guess I considered, and I'll talk about it here in a little bit, is the way that children view our parents. And like I know for me, when I was growing up, my dad is a lot taller than I am. He's about 6'4". 
Um, but my dad, he seemed like a giant at times. And my mom, if all the different things that she did in terms of teaching and coming home and being mom at the same time, it almost seemed like our, my parents were superheroes. And that's how I pray my kids kind of view me a little bit. But I think one of the things that we can consider all of this, and those of us watching at home as well, is how we view God. God isn't just a superhero. He isn't just somebody who's there who makes things happen for us. He's, think of him as your loving father. Like, all the love that your parents give to you, you can multiply that by millions and you're still not going to get God's love for you. So much so that we even know that God, in his mercy, because he loves you so much, he gave us his only begotten son to die for us and that one day, we too can spend eternity with God. And that's truly an amazing thing that he's done for us. And he did that because he loves you so much. And so I know there are different things that we experience, different fears and different anxieties that we might have in the season as things rapidly change or escalate. But just always remember how much God loves you, that he loves you so much, he gave up his son to die for you so that he can spend eternity with you forever. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your great love for us, for everything that you've done and everything that you continue to do. Help us when we're afraid and keep us securely in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have you ever been truly humbled? Not just like the idea of being a little embarrassed or a little red in the face, but humbled. When you're reminded that you're thinking way too highly about yourself than you probably should be. For me, I had this experience about a year ago or so. I had the opportunity to come and was invited to preach at the congregation that I went to when I was in high school and the congregation that my parents still attend in Lincoln, Nebraska. One of the cool things about this church, and a little side note, by the way, for those of you who didn't know, a little secret about preaching, you can see everything when you're preaching. Just by nature of where you're standing, you can see everybody out in the congregation. You can see people who are sleeping. You can see people on their cell phones. You can see people who are eating. You can see it all when you're standing up front. And it's really kind of a neat thing sometimes. Sometimes it's also very humbling. For me, I had this opportunity and I was excited because this congregation had a tradition of inviting former sons of the congregation back to preach when, if they were attending the seminary. And so I was excited to get this opportunity. And during the course of my sermon, which I thought was really good, I thought it was a well-constructed sermon. I was engaging. I was preaching the gospel. I was fulfilling all the requirements of the second year preaching class at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. But then I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I kind of turned and looked, and I saw my dad motioning to my mom, and he was pointing at somebody sitting next to them. The lady next to them had her head back, mouth open, sleeping like a baby. Wow. Talk about a humbling experience. The past several weeks, we've been walking through some really difficult words of Jesus together. We've seen Jesus take what might appear to be some extreme positions, and in doing so, he's dramatically altering the views of his hearers to get them more firmly in line with what God has been calling us to, how God calls us to live. Today, we're actually going to look at Jesus' words from Matthew 18. This section has taken on the title of Diminution, Disorientation, and Drowning. In our gospel for today, we see Jesus radically changing the disciples' opinions regarding importance and power. Diminution can be defined as a reduction in the size, extent, or the importance of something. And when it comes to the disciples' question, Jesus quickly reduces their size. We see the disciples playing their favorite game of who is the greatest. Now, this is a game that we see them playing constantly throughout the Gospels, and we see even eventually Matt or James and John, their mom steps up the ante by even coming to Jesus on her son's behalf and saying, Lord, can you give my sons a high position in your kingdom? 
Now, this wasn't there quite yet. The disciples at this point are trying to drag in who they saw as being the ultimate referee, Jesus. And it's interesting because as we see in the gospel, Jesus doesn't indulge their game. Jesus destroys their game. What he does, Jesus reverses it on the 12 and takes a child and places it in the midst of them and says, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Not only is Jesus using a child to bring them down from their high position, he's telling them that unless they have faith like this child, they won't even get in to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the modern view that we have of children being ones we should emulate, being viewed as wise in a way that maybe adults no longer are from maybe various trials and tribulations that we experience in this earthly life, now, that view is dramatically different than what we would have seen in first century Judea. The thing is, in this time, one simply does not compare adults to a child. And children, they're seen as weak. They're seen as having no social status or influence. They're without understanding. They cannot care for themselves. They're not wise. They're not capable. They're gullible. And finally, and most important really when we talk about this era, they're incapable of defending themselves against any enemies. In short, they're children. Isaiah even talks about the idea of a, pro, of a child ruling as being a curse in Isaiah 3. Isaiah says, I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule them. And the people will oppress one another, every one his fellow, and every one his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder, and the despised to the honorable. Sounds great, doesn't it? To be sure, the people of first century Judea loved and cherished their children. They saw them as blessings of God. But to compare an adult to a child or tell an adult that they should be like a child is simply crazy. So how should we as Christians look at this idea? How should we look at what Jesus is telling us and apply this to our own life? To be honest, we need to go back to the list. The list of why you don't compare an adult to a child. Before God, we're weak. We have no social status or influence. We're without understanding. We cannot care for ourselves. We're not wise. We're not capable. We're gullible. And finally, we're incapable of defending against the ultimate enemy, Satan. Why should we have faith like a child? Because a child recognizes their spot. They recognize their situation and their need for help. They know that they and have the humility to realize they need someone bigger and someone greater than themselves. As a father, this is something I've experienced and I'll forever cherish. It's those moments as a father and as any parent that make you feel like Superman or Superwoman. For me, it came when my daughter was an infant and lying on the couch at 3 a.m., watching the 10th rerun of SportsCenter again and being able to predict all the plays but the fact is, is that is the only way she would sleep. Or for my son, when he wanders into our bedroom at like three in the morning and completely terrifies us because he's so quiet and we don't hear him coming, but he had a nightmare. And he's coming to talk to me because dad is the one who he knows can make it better. That's how Jesus calls upon us to look at our heavenly father. We're called to recognize our situation and in childlike humility to come and submit ourselves before God, recognizing that on our own, we're weak and defenseless. Knowing that the one who recognizes their situation and who humbly trusts in God will truly be the greatest in the kingdom. If we come to Jesus with nothing, Jesus takes us in his arms and gives us everything. That's the power that we have in humility before God. When we come to Jesus with nothing, we can be assured that, he, assured that he will always give us far more than we ever deserve. But we can't forget about the other words of Jesus from our reading. Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. That's quite the turn. We might think about welcoming a little one in Jesus' name, and I'm sure that we've all had the, have an idea that might jump into our heads. 
for me, the idea that jumps to my head is the idea of Jesus sitting down, arms outstretched, welcoming children forward. It's an image that literally comes from the next chapter of Matthew and one that might resonate with a lot of us. Some of us might even have this image posted in our own house. Jesus welcoming the children to himself is something we as Christians try to emulate. And there are many different things that Holy Trinity has even done as a congregation to welcome children in. But I honestly, I would say the most important step that as a congregation you've taken is the development and continued support of your own Lutheran school. Think about the thousands of children who have walked through these hallways and have heard about Jesus because of this congregation. While we often love to remember the things we do, we selectively ignore the things that we have in fact done that have caused a little one to sin. An action that, as Jesus says, means a rather unpleasant punishment. These moments might not always be amazingly clear. They could be a moment where we break the Eighth Commandment's prohibition against bearing false witness. This could be done accidentally in the car after someone cuts us off for about the fifth time in traffic. It could be something that's done at home, what you think is a private conversation between yourself and your beloved. It could be a moment where we overindulge in food at dinner. Maybe we have a drink too many. Maybe you take out your frustration with work on your family. And in doing so, you accidentally are showing your child or your children or your grandchildren that this is how we're supposed to act. Causing a child to sin could mean possibly placing a child in the middle of a marital dispute. This is a toxic situation. It's unhealthy for any child. And it's a thing that can and will stay with them for the rest of their life. Perhaps it's a situation when after you get cut off or after you have a bad news delivered to you, you utter a curse word in a moment of frustration. And your child, who happens to be in the room, starts saying the same thing. I know the list of how I cause my own children to sin could go on and on and on. And it gets more and more and more unpleasant the more I think about it. But it is something that I have to consider. It's something that I have to examine as a reality in my own life. Examination of this clearly shows that I too, I'm worthy of that millstone. Now you might be wondering, what if my child doesn't see this? Or I know those, I don't do those kinds of things around my child. For being honest, you might not realize it, but you've done it. We've all done it. And when viewed this way, we recognize that our sinful condition, it's important that we see that we've all fallen short. We've all sinned in our, fallen short in our callings as parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts, friends and loved ones. We've all caused a little one to sin, and in doing so, we all stand condemned before the words of Jesus. Now, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. So what exactly does Jesus mean here? Does he mean any sin? What exactly is a millstone? Doesn't look real pleasant, does it? I, well, we could shift that and say, well, I've received a child in Jesus' name, so that means I'm fine, right? But as we've seen, the answer is no. We've all caused a little one to sin, and we've all fallen short of this command in our various vocations. We're all worthy of having that millstone fastened around our neck and being cast into the sea. We're all guilty, and we all stand condemned before God. We all deserve to be drowned. As Paul says in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Your sin, my sin. It's permanently separated us from God, and the wages of sin is indeed death. Even the most picture-perfect examples of a human that we can think of in our life, that person still has or eventually will be earn the wage for their sin. We've all caused a little one to sin and all fallen short, and because of this, that wage is waiting for us. Now, it might not be a millstone, but the darkness of death itself is still waiting, whether it's the depth of the sea or the depth of a grave. It's still waiting for us all. While we all deserve to be drowned in the darkness of the sea, we know, though, as Christians, this is not how that story ends. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sin. 
If Christ has not been raised, we still deserve that millstone. We still all deserve to be eternally separated from God, and we still deserve the punishment. If Christ has not been raised, we will stand before an almighty God covered in our sin. But Paul goes on in verse 21. Paul says, Just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus Christ is no longer dead in the grave. Jesus Christ is risen, and with his resurrection, he has opened up the gates of heaven to us. Therefore, despite our sin, despite our causing the little ones to sin, we're washed clean before God. Paul doesn't end Romans 6.23 with the simple fact that the wages of sin is death. He continues. End of the verse says, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The sins we've committed, the moments that we fall hopelessly short, the moments that we cause little ones to sin, they're washed clean. Jesus Christ has won the victory for us And in his mercy, he removes that millstone from around our necks and places it around his own. He descended the depth for us, and because he lives, we know that we will live also. Even though Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's not how that story ends. As Christians, we get to continue with that beautiful gospel that comes next. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. When God looks at you, he no longer sees a hopelessly lost individual. He no longer sees someone who deserves to have that millstone tied around their neck and cast to the depth. No, when God looks at you, he sees a beloved child. He sees a child whose sin has been tied to that millstone and has been cast in the waters of holy baptism. With regard to our status as beloved and forgiven children of God, does this mean that we go forward sinless? Of course not. But it means that when we sin, and we will, that we go before our loving Heavenly Father, We're not treated as outsiders. We're treated as dearly loved children of God because of the sacrifice made by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the one who makes everything better. Now as children of God, we're given total and complete forgiveness. Jesus Christ has thrown open the doors of heaven for us. Because Christ has already thrown those doors open, we're now able to go to those around us who are wandering, who are disoriented, who don't yet know that they've been given the fullness that comes through a life lived in Jesus Christ. In our new life, Christ calls us all to be shepherds. Jesus calls on us to leave the sheep, to find the one that's lost and bring it back to the fold. These sheep aren't yet lost, they've only gone astray. The term in the Greek literally means wandering. It's not yet lost. Disorientation, it's a condition of having lost one's sense of direction. There are literally billions of people right now who are disoriented. They have either lost their sense of direction or they've never heard the promises of Jesus Christ. And this is what Christ calls upon us to do. It's our mission, both as a church and our calling as Christians. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And I will be with you always until the end of the age. We're called to go forth and help shepherd these people who are disoriented back to the fold, help them to find their way back. Back to the one thing that truly offers all that we need. Back to the one place where we can find true life and true joy. It's a life that's lived in the forgiveness that comes with the victory won by Jesus Christ on that first Easter. Now, you might be wondering how my humbling experience concluded. Well, after the service, I was standing out front greeting everyone, and I was able to finish with a flourish, I guess, and everyone came out, and of course, this is pre-COVID, and the lady walked up, and an older lady in a wheelchair, and I said, did you enjoy the sermon? And she says, oh, it was wonderful. I'm not entirely sure if she was help, trying to make me feel better or if she was referencing her nap, but one way or another, the lesson in humility had been given and had been received. Thanks, Grandma. 
Humility in this world can be a really difficult thing, but as Christians, we're called to humble ourselves like a child. We're called to rely fully and unquestionably upon the life-giving work of Jesus Christ. In that humbleness, we're then called to go forward and find those who are disoriented, to search out the people in our communities who are lost and who are broken, and to come alongside them in their journeys. We should go like a young child who gets to work with their father, who gets to go out and we get to help in the amazing plan of salvation for the world by reaching out to those who are lost around us and because our sins are already drowned in the waters of holy baptism. And one day, we know in the not too distant future, Christ will return and that faith that we have will finally become sight. And we get to spend eternity with our loving heavenly father and with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and with all those saints, all of those people who have gone before us. In the meantime, our shepherd has given us some work to do. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Vicar. Pretty sure I've put my own uh, grandparents to sleep before, too. Uh, <laughs> With that, uh, as our band is getting ready, let's receive our closing and benediction. To God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in his holy church forever and ever. Amen. Christ died. Christ is risen. Christ shall come again. Vicar referenced this, but it's a statement that we say every week. Jesus said, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Love God, love one another, and love your neighbor. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We sing our last song. Good. Yeah.
God's peace and sing of his goodness. Amen. Jesus died.